host Hilara Sen, aka Pink Unicorn, I have great news! The Bank of Japan has a woman as one of its top officials outside the policy board for the first time since it was founded in 1882. First time in 138 years! There have been a lot of great, talented, and intelligent Japanese females from Queen Himiko, Empress Masako, Sadako Gata, but actually the total number of Japanese female leaders is still very small. You know, 2020's gender gap ranking out of 153 countries, Japan was placed in number one, two, one, yes! 121st! If the ranking were the hottest actress list 150, that would be Seth Rogen and Andy Serkis in Thai. Yeah, it took 138 years, but you know, the history has just moved. Ambitious, beloved, and beautiful women made new histories. And Rita Taketsuru was also one of them. The father of Japanese whiskey, Masataka Taketsuru, built the first whiskey distilleries in Yamazaki, made the first Japanese whiskey and Nikka with her great support. And the funny thing is, until the first whiskey was released, nothing came out, although gigantic amount of barley was brought in the still every day. So local people around the still were terrified, like, there should be a huge monster called Usuke inside it. I would have said, yeah, but it is just body. We should be okay. Anyway, this year is 100th anniversary of marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Taketsuru and the 19th Amendment. I really hope society move forward to, to create new values for after coronavirus, accepting and blending differences in harmony, just like whiskey. Alright ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have a special guest from UK. He is really good looking, handsome, pretty and nice and also expert of Japanese whiskey. He is the UK ambassador for the House of Santry. He has 10 years of bartending experience working in some amazing bars with some enviable Japanese whiskey collections, including Bar High Five in Tokyo. So please welcome James Barker! Hello! Wow, thank you very much for joining us tonight! Yay! Japanese whiskey fans, including me, must be feeling very envious. Yes, I'm feeling very, very envious. How did you learn this dream role? So I've just been really lucky that I've been working in food and drinks for a really long time now, for just over 10 years. And I was just lucky enough to land a job at High Five out in Tokyo. I worked there for a bit and then when I returned, I was just, I'd already loved Japan before I went and then I came back and it was a whole other level of love. And I eventually it just came to, became the case, I got a phone call saying there's a job out for Suntory, are you excited to be a part of that? And I was like, does that mean I get to drink whiskey? Excellent, and now I just genuinely have the dream job. It's great. So High Five is in Ginza, right? It's it's very good bar, I think, and I've never been there. But uh, what what is the bar like? Also, I'm sure you've been to Ginza style bars before. They're quite old school in terms of uh -huh. the, they tend to be a bit quieter. They tend to be quite small. There's a real focus on kind of refined classic cocktails. You know that kind of kaizen idea of always improving on traditional products. They're making the same cocktails as they were a hundred years ago but they're just making the best possible versions and it's, it is such a special bar. Wow, wow, quite interesting. And uh, how did you become interested in Japanese whiskey? I tried Yamazaki 12 year old at the age of like, just very, just when I turned 18 and I remember thinking, that's actually something I can drink. And then fast forward a few years, I was working in this five star hotel and we had a big collection of them. And I just fell in love with the story, the history, the emotion, but also for me that kind of slightly more delicate style of whiskey where it's got all the complexity but it's just presented in a more gentle way. Mm. What part of history uh, were you interested in? 
the, the balance between craftsmanship in Japan, whether it's knife making or sushi or origami, whatever it is, and how that then has fed into the whiskey making traditions and how different each company, how differently they all approach making whiskey. So Suntory is much more about the blending, obviously, whereas Nika is much more about creating the big full bodied whiskies that you've got Fuji Gutemba about the grain. There's so much variety and that's why. Mm. In terms of style for one country, I think it's amazing. Okay, so oh, Toki, uh, to be honest, I, I'm not so familiar with Toki because I don't think we can find it in Japan so easily. So could you explain about Toki a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Toki is obviously it's a blended whiskey from Suntory. It's something that's mainly for what's known as the international market, so not really for Japan, which would be why you can't find it. But this is kind of the entry level blend. And the idea is to be, you know, complex and yet sufficiently light body and delicate. And there's a really interesting story in this, which when you taste it, if you ask someone, tell me how smoky is this whiskey? They'll probably say, oh, you know, out of 10, it's like a two or a three on smokiness. But the reality is that it's actually mostly really heavily peated or really smoky whiskey. So you kind of wonder where where the smoke's gone, why has it disappeared? And when Suntory were exploring, you know, which whiskies can we use that are a bit younger, but still just complex enough, and they, they still have all that intensity and that quality you expect from Suntory, they found that at the Hakushi distillery, so if you look at the, the Hakushi whiskies up here, they always have like an apple flavor and a smoky flavor. That's what you always expect in Hakushi. And mm. around eight, eight and a half, nine years old, obviously depending on where in the warehouse the barrel is, Suddenly, around that age, something um, in the barrel changes. The, the molecule that gives you a smoky flavor bonds with another molecule. We're not sure what molecule that is, but it bonds with another flavor molecule in the barrel. And they kind of attach to each other and they make a baby flavor. And that baby flavor doesn't taste like apple. It doesn't taste like smoke. It tastes like sweet pears. And mm. that lasts about three months. So after three months, the smoke comes back, the apple comes back, and the pear goes away. So the clever thing about Toki is that over half of the blend is this special age of young Hakushu, kind of eight, nine-year-old whiskey that is really bright, really vibrant, and doesn't have that smokiness. Instead, the smokiness becomes fruit, effectively, which uh, reminds me of an amazing evening I spent in uh, in Tokyo drinking Karazawa. Have you tried many Karazawas, uh, Kalarasan? No way! Okay. No tried, way! One. No! One day, give a try. I mean, it's it's become very expensive now. So whether it's worth yeah. money, who knows? But it's it's a fascinating whiskey to taste. But one of my best, best memories of Japan. Um, so my agreement with in my apprenticeship was I was working a lot of hours, working entirely unpaid. But the benefit for me was also I was learning how to do the Japanese bartending style, but also uh, my boss, who I'm really so grateful for, uh, too, rather, Wayne san used to let me taste any whiskey I wanted, anytime, as long as the, shop, the bar was closed, I could taste whiskeys. And so every night after we finished, it might be four o'clock in the morning, it might be five o'clock, I would stay behind. He would always fall asleep on the sofa every night, and I would then uh, I would start tasting whiskeys and writing my notes down. And one night I was tasting away and suddenly he kind of shoots, he kind of comes awake and I just go, ah, like, you're right, Wayne Hassan. And he goes, James, what are you drinking? And I was, I was so scared because I was like, maybe, maybe I'm going to lose my job, my friend, like, you know, and he said, it's fine, it's fine. And um, what are you drinking? And I said, well, don't worry, not the expensive stuff, just these ones. I haven't tried the Hanyu, I haven't tried the Karazawa, I haven't tried the expensive Suntory. He says, don't worry, you can try those tomorrow, okay? Anything you want, the expensive ones tomorrow. Today, wow. I have a special treat for you. And he kind of shuffles away and he comes back with a plastic 7-Eleven carrier bag and he dumps it on the bar. And there's a clattering sound and he pulls out these 10 sample bottles, 100 milliliter sample bottles, because he was gifted, um, kind of 15 years ago or so, he was gifted his own cask of Karazawa from 1981. And we tasted every year of the last 10 years of him going back and just taking a little sample. And really that just taught me so much about how important the warehouse is and the warehouse manager choosing these whiskies, how important blending is. But also, I just got to try 10 Karazawa with one of my absolute idols. Best moment ever. Great. Wow. Interesting. Uh, I think a lot of our audience got interested in Japanese whiskey and you more. So uh, where can we find out about you and your information? So the easiest way, as with everything these days, especially in lockdown, is Instagram. So uh, James Balker Drinks 
is the easiest way. Uh, but it, if you just drop me a message on Instagram, I can give you my email address really easily. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. Thank you. being used in some countries like in the UK two people from different households in England can meet in outdoor settings as long as they stay more than two meters apart hmm. that would be perfect for my favorite public activity messing with joggers so really want to go to UK now so I can hurt them like a sheepdog Hui! Hui! And also, people in the UK, congratulations! Now they are allowed to take unlimited exercise! No, thank you. 10 push ups are enough for me. For a year? One a month. Because I take summer months off. <laughs>
ask for forgiveness, darling. I can't give it to you. Great, so beautiful and so powerful. I think a lot of people uh, want to know more about you. So where can we find find about your activity or uh, more about you? Instagram. Um, I think I'm yeah Gab Chilmi on Instagram or Gabriella Chilmi on Instagram. Yeah, just type me in and I'll be there. And yeah, Facebook and Twitter, all that stuff. And um, last year I released an EP called the Water EP. And that's on like iTunes, Spotify, um, all that stuff. So yeah, you can you can you can hear music on Spotify. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, just check out Gabriela Chilmi. Thank you so much. is bigger than the 1963 Slipstream RV, we are not going through this together. If your answer to running out of toilet paper is to have your personal lumberjack Henry head to your private old gross forest, then we are not going through this together. If you are Ellen, then we are not going through this together. If your idea of social distancing is only allowing 10 people on your private jet to Monaco instead of 20, then we are not going through this together! <laughs> if one of the items on your Instacart list is extra virgin Parisian lamp oil, then we are not going through this together! <laughs> Very amazing guest. Uh, he is the world's leading non Japanese sake expert. He wrote the Nihonshu column in the Japan Times for eight years. He has published five books on sake. So please welcome John Gantana san! Hi everyone, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So, oh, how long have you been in Japan? I got there in 1989, so I guess 30, uh -huh. almost exactly 31 years. Ma, ma, coming up in 31 years. Wow, wow. And could you tell us in simple terms uh, what types of sake are available? There's one way to divide all sake up, and that's by how much you've milled the rice. Basically, the more of the outside of the rice you grind away, the more elegant and refined and light and aromatic the sake will be. So there's a lot of ways to divide sake up. But one of the easiest ways to divide it up is something called ginjo. Mm -hmm. And that means they've milled the rice a lot to take away the outside. Why do they do that? Because there's fat and protein in the outside of the rice. And that will make the, that will make the sake heavy. So if you mill that away, you will have a lighter sake and a more aromatic sake. And that's called ginjo. So one way to divide sake up is ginjo and everything else. Ginjo is not necessarily better. It's just more expensive, it's lighter, and it's fruitier. The heavier sake is delicious as well. That's one way to divide it up. Another way to divide it up is the types of sake that are made with rice water and something called koji only, and the other stuff where they make it with rice water, koji, and a little bit of alcohol. And sometimes they add the alcohol to make it cheaper. And sometimes they add the alcohol to make it lighter and more aromatic. So when they don't add the alcohol, that's called junmai, and it's richer. And when they do add the alcohol, they can't use the junmai word, and it's lighter. So you can divide it by ginjo and non-ginjo, or junmai and non-junmai. 
I know you wanted a simple answer, but unfortunately I can't give you one. <laughs> but here's a great thing, here's a great thing. To me, one of the easiest things to remember about sake is this. 90% of the time, sake is fairly priced. Not 100% of the time, but 90% of the time. The more you pay, the more expressive, lively, aromatic the sake will be. As you drink sake with more experience, very often you'll say, okay, I understand that, but now I want something richer or more settled. Sometimes people that drink a lot don't want all kinds of fruity aromas, right? But if you're just trying to get into it and you don't understand terms or regionality or rice types, just make a decision on price and 90% of the time you'll be satisfied with your decision. That's great. You can't say that about too many beverages in the world. What flavor profiles can we expect? We talked about ginjo earlier where you mill the rice a lot on the outside to take away that fat and protein. That tends to be very fruity in aroma. And when I say fruity, I mean strawberry, melon, banana, apple, grapefruit. But if you don't mill the rice that far, if you don't go into the ginjo realms, you can get all kinds of stuff. Earthy, rich, acidic, umami, uh, sake with lots of umami in it. Um, all kinds of flavors, uh, lots of rice flavors for sure. So it really depends on how you make the sake and what you're trying to bring out. So there's a very, very wide range of flavors and aromas that you can enjoy in sake. It sounds really interesting. What would you say to someone who has never tried a sake before? Start with ginjo. It's gonna be the easiest thing to remember and it's gonna be the most impressive. If you have ginjo, you're sure to say, wow, this is sake, and you'll try it again. However, I know, don't stay there. In other words, you try ginjo, move on. Try all the other grades too, because you might find something that you like better, right? So start with ginjo because it will be the most impressive, the easiest to be to understand, the easiest to, to uh, be impressed with. Um, I would also say start with it slightly chilled because most ginjo, not all, but most ginjo, the aromas and flavors are most easily enjoyable when it's slightly chilled. But I, also, I would also say move on from there. Don't stay there. I can see it. it sounds similar to whiskey, I guess. Yes. Probably. I mean, they're both kind of sort of products. You know, I can't see that learning to understand them should be too different. Yeah. How is sake produced? Sake is actually brewed more closely to a beer than it is to anything else. If you look at how wine is made, wine is a simple fermentation because you've got sugar in the grape juice. And the yeast just needs that sugar to give you carbon dioxide and alcohol. Um, and when you make a beer or sake, you start with a grain. In the case of beer, it's barley. In the case of sake, it's rice. But there's no sugar in barley or rice. There's only starch. So you have to chop the starch and the sugar first, and then you can chop that sugar into alcohol. In beer, they do that by malting the barley. So they turn the barley into bakuga, and that gives you enzymes. However, when you make rice, you can't do that because you've milled the rice. There's no outside part. So they use a mold called kojiki, and they sprinkle that on there to make koji, which gives you enzymes, which does the same thing as malting the barley. Uh, Japanese people drink sake in hot and cold, in either right. way. Yeah, so what's the difference or uh, which do you recommend? The short answer is you can enjoy sake both warm and cold. Most ginjo, most of the time, not always, and not all ginjo, but most of the time, slightly chilled is better. But fuller grades of sake, Junmaishu, other types called Yamahai, Kimoto, things like that, those are much better warm. And the only difference is not the grade, but how it tastes. Full, I know, fruity aromas aren't good for warm, warming sake. When you warm fruity aromas, you lose them. So they're not, for, fruity sake is not good for warming. But richer sake, earthier sake, fuller sake, sake with lots of umami, it's just outstanding warmed. So both are good. Start with Ginjo chilled and move on from there. Check them all out. I'll tell you this too. The older I get, the more I like warm sake. <laughs> I suggest you experiment once in a while. So, uh, John Gontana-san, thank you very much for great information. That was a really amazing time. So, uh, I think a lot of the audience uh, want to try sake more too. So, where can we find out more about sake? Well, I maintain a website called Sake World, and it's sake-world.com. Okay, you can learn a lot about sake on that site, and you can sign up for a free newsletter. So, by all means, check that out if you're interested. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. That was amazing. It was very much my pleasure. Thank you very much. Take care.
tuning into Japanese whiskey lockdown. I believe you enjoyed it, and of course, I appreciate your support as always. If you are in America, as long as you read news, it seems America is facing tougher or crazier situation, even more than usual. So I really wish you health and safety, and pay huge respect to great work of all medical workers all over the world. Speaking of America, May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, right? So I think it's the best timing to enjoy Japanese whiskey and Japanese cultures and other Asian cultures. So today, for when you get bored or upset at staying home, let me introduce a very easy Japanese traditional play, which you can do at home. Origami. Oh, don't worry, it's very easy. Two or three minutes, you can make this origami crane. How to make this? Just go YouTube, like me. Anyways. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe our YouTube channel and follow my social medias by Kirara Comedy. And again, I really wish you safety and health. Goodbye.